Well, this is my last talk. I want to tell you what uh, an exciting uh, experience I have to be there, there here, and uh, I want to thank you for all your kindness. Well, I don't have nothing to disclose. I like this. Uh, Dr. Harry Sherman, Sherman in 1902 said that the road to the heart is only two or three centimeters in a direct line, but it has taken surgery nearly 2,400 uh, years to travel it. This uh, Harry Sherman is a professor of, was a professor of surgery from the University of California and published a review of 34 cases of cardiac wound repairs between 19, 1896 and um, 1902 in several countries. <coughs> Why 1896? It's because in that year, Dr. Ludwig Rehn, a, surgeon, a German surgeon, performed the first successful repair of cardiac wound. His pioneering work marked the beginning of a cardiac surgery. He was very lucky because the patient waited stable 24 hours before the surgery. Prior 1896, wounds of the heart considered fatal injuries. Ten years later, he had compiled 20, 124 cases of cardiac injury managed surgically with a 40% survival rate. One of his main opponents were uh, Dr. Theodore Billroth that condemned both pericardiosynthesis and any surgical attempts at repairing the, wound, the wounded heart. Another, uh, one of the comments was that a surgeon who tries to suture a heart wound deserves to lose the esteem of his colleagues. And another comment, uh, nice, I like that, this was, paracentesis of the pericardium is an operation which, in my opinion, approached very closely to that kind of intervention which some surgeons would term a prostitution of the surgical art and other madness. So, in the beginning, um, there was previous attempts uh, uh, to relieve a wounded heart and lung. In 1910, the, uh, the Napoleon Surgeon Baron Dominique Loray tried to do that. And also, Francisco Romero from Barcelona uh, tried, tried to, to do that too, in maybe in the same, in the same time. But in uh, 1976, their uh, underwater system was a huge milestone in the progress of management, penetrating chest trauma, and overcoming the inherent problem of associated hemoneumothorax and allowing for expansion of the, of, the, of the lung. Unfortunately, an successful repairs of one heart prior to Dr. Rain was from Ansel Kaplan from Norway in 1895, and another from Guido Farina of Rome in 1896. Um, unfortunately, these uh, first two attempts to suture a one heart died to complications. The first one inherent to a procedure uh, by a ligation of coronary artery in a 24-year-old stab wound guy, and the other uh, seven days uh, um, after due to bronchopneumonia. In the beginning of the 20th century, there were 75 operations with a mortality rate around 45%, just opened pericardium. But mortality uh, increased now from 22, 27 to 63% in the early 1950s, uh, when the patient was seldom operated upon in most centers until there have been several attempts made at pericardial synthesis. Uh, this management protocol changed dramatically after 1965 when all patients with the diagnosis of stab wound of the heart were managed with an emergency thoracotomy, dropping to 5% between 1965 and 1967, when all patients were taken to, to thoracotomy. So, he was the first thing that to take home, that immediate cardiography becoming the universal treatment of choice. And the second one is uh, that drainage is the second principle. According to the ATLS protocol, even when an optional skill is in the course is, there was a tendency to discredit the pericardial synthesis most of the time by us, trauma surgeons, but I think it still have a place in the armamentarium to solve emergency situations in hostile environments, like a temporal procedure to the next level of care. Pericardial window also, by the other hand, is preferably by some level two, some level three trauma centers when the fat exam is unavailable or inconclusive. In terms to review that what happens with the pericardial synthesis, this is an interesting review, search scientific publications from 1972 to uh, 2010, 
involving pericardios and tesis after trauma. Only 27 studies met the criteria, but the results are amazing supporting the pericardios and tesis when definitive surgical management is not immediately available and has difficulties in transport time to a better care facility, like a measure for temporary decompression. Look in the slide, the overall mortality uh, about a PCC as sole bridging intervention, 83%. PCC and no other surgical intervention, 91.8%, and thoracotomy following pericardiosynthesis in a less percent, and thoracotomy only uh, less than that. Other, or, uh, another recent publication this year from the group of Denver compared the pericardial drainage in the emergency department versus operated pericardial drainage in 78 survivor patients in a 16 year study period. It's maybe the first report who compares the pericardial drainage options. They conclude that pericardial drainage in the emergency department is a viable option for stabilization before definitive surgery, when surgical intervention is not immediately available in the hemodynamically marginal patient. Early pericardial drainage in patients with penetrated cardiac injury, injury do not negatively affect patient outcomes by the physiologic argument that the relief of pericardial tamponade could alleviate early myocardial ischemia, mitigating malignant arrhythmias, and also drainage improve hemodynamics in the majority of patients. In both types of injuries, um, the major issue is missing the diagnosis and high mortality. Blunt is the most common non-surgical injury, but these are two conditions that really represent the challenge, the cardiac rupture and the herniation. Herniation of the heart is a fatal complication on was reported in 0.4% of cerebral trauma. So penetrating, bless you. So penetrating trauma is a real surgical condition. Sometimes the treatment is before the diagnosis and you have to make an extra resuscitative efforts. Most of the time you have to see what happens with the heart. And this is a third principle, the diagnostic suspicion and understand the pathophysiology. Understanding the physiologic change when the heart was injured. The pathophysiology of cardiac penetration is a combination of the relative roles of pericardial tamponade and severe hemorrhage. It is determined by the size of pericardial tension, the rate of bleeding from the cardiac wound, and the chamber of the heart involved. Also, you have to explain yourself what those the clinical findings are trying to tell you. This classic triad of the standard neck veins by elevation of central venous pressure, muffling heart, sounds, and hypotension, and sometimes paradoxic pulses, is only present in less than 10% of the patients. So you have to be aware of the findings. Physical exam is very important too, because I don't know if someone of you think it's not a surgical candidate to explore what happened inside the chest and review the lung, heart, and, and ilium. What do you think was the better approach uh, with this guy? The other diagnostic tools is a number of studies by Rosicki and colleagues have evaluated the use of ultrasound in the trauma setting. One of the studies of uh, 313 patients who sustained precordial transthoracic wounds, 289 had true negative pericardial examination with 100% sensitivity. In the trauma setting, pericardial ultrasound has the advantage of being non-invasive, repeatable, portable, rapid, and cost-effective. Actually, surgeons perform fast very quickly in the, in the emergency department. And right now, the first choice is instead other diagnostic therapeutic options like pericardial windows. Let's talk about a little bit from a pericardial window. It can be performed under local or general anesthesia. You have to make a vertical midline incision, 10 centimeters, centimeters no more, just below the heat void process, upper epigastrium, it's a preperitoneal approach that needs for better performance to move the, the table of the patient uh, a little bit head up. This trick makes the heart rest in the pericardial diaphragmatic surface, but please do not open the peritoneum. It's just below you cut the fascia and make a blunt dissection with the finger to go in. Immediately try to feel the heartbeat. If you feel tenderness, if you cannot feel the movement of the heart, be ready to open the pericardium and maybe the chest too in the next, in the next step. Try to open the pericardium with gentle traction, and when you open, instill some water, no cold water, and aspirate the content. Try to find blood and clots that suggest any injury to the heart. When you open the, in a thoracotomy, the pericardium, pinch it with, a, with your fingers or between the two clamps and make a neck with the scissors anterior to the nerve. 
wide open. If you find blood and hole, first attempt to stop the bleeding, but consider to extend the right side with a clamshell incision. Here is what is the dangerous zone that alerts you to the presence of heart injuries. It's the box. We move the limits uh, a little bit uh, to, the, to the left. Um, uh, the box that is a, a square between the mid clavicular right line and anterior left axillary, two lower ribs just below the hip foot process and the sternal notch. You have to rule out cardiac damage if any violation of the chest wall inside this limit. Choosing the correct incision may be the, the fourth surgical principle of wounded heart. Um, choosing the correct incision may well be the most important strategic decision in a trauma thoracotomy. In most of the time, unstable patients with suspicion for penetrating cardiac injury, anterolateral thoracotomy is the best choice. Spangaro describes this incision in the past century and is still useful. But in stable patients with evidence of heart injury, sternotomy is a good way to find it and fix it. It gives you the full access to the heart and great vessels and the upper medistinum. Both incisions have advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages for the anterolateral thoracotomy is that allows you to expand to the other side and control hemorrhage from, uh, from the ilium bilateral. One disadvantage is that you have to cut both mammary arteries. Stern, uh, uh, sternotomy also allows you to go down to the abdomen and go to the, the neck too. You see here an example of Spangaro incision. It's a junk patient we have with multiple stab wounds, approximately 26 in the, in the chest. We count overall 30, 30, 74 in the whole body. He had five holes in, in, in the heart, all of these in the right and left ventricle, about less than 0.5 millimeters. We successfully repaired all, but them, all of them, but we, he died 12 hours later by lethal arrhythmia and uh, also a bad physiologic status. Here, here's the repair. This is a clamshell incision that you can see how you can expose all the, the upper mediastinum and the heart and the both ileum too. So close the pericardium is an enigma. You have to open it. Be aware may, may not be what it seems. You never know what is going inside. Be careful is avoiding the phrenic Nerve only. Fifth surgical principle is fingers and folic catheters, as Dr. Chad so, uh, told, uh, told us uh, in his uh, lecture. It's a very good friend. Folic catheters are mostly 16 and 18 French are good tools to use in emergency situations. So when you in a front cardiac injury with a big hole, consider to put one and inflate with a little amount of water. The, obje the objective is to occlude the systolic output from the hole. Use the not too much rule, that is not too much traction, not too much water to the balloon, not too much time, and not too much uh, foliage catheters too. Look to the cardiac output. It's about 60 to 100 uh, millimeters of blood per beat. So you have to quickly to go and put the finger on it and let the heart, the heart restore. The heart restore is getting back from a big, big exercise. When the heart rate drops, then it's time to suture or put a folic cutter if you didn't do yet. We, we use a non-absorbable proline, three, ser three zeros, without platelets. We only use it when gunshot wounds, when it's available, or sometimes pericardium patch. In the literature, you find some experience with skin stapler putting in the, in the like, to repair the hole. I, I really don't have experience or opportunity to use it. Foley cutters are even good to stop temporarily the bleeding in other sites, like, like the lung, both in a through and through bullets, stop the bleeding or, of hemorrhage and uh, air leak by staple the tractotomy later. Wall and colleagues. In a 20-year experience with 711 cardiac injuries, found 60 complex injuries, including 39 to the coronary arteries. So the correct way of avoiding the vessel is using a used suture behind the coronary artery. That is mostly the sex principle, surgical principle. Here's another patient's table with a wound in the box. The fast exam, the fast exam shows a little displacement of the heart with an interface of liquid. It's a, you suspect a cardiac injury, what do you do next? 
we go to the OR and perform an sternotomy with a jiggle saw, open the pericardium, and blood comes out. I put my finger there, you saw here. Oh, here, yeah. Then put a, a Foley catheter just to put it the, 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 uh, the hole, not, not too much. And this is the final suture, you see it there, the diaphragmatic surface. And it's good to be very, pretty well, good to be vital signs. So in summary, cardiac injury is still fatal without treatment or delay. Technology and trauma systems um, make the patients go to the emergency departments instead of uh, die in the, in the streets. Remember the principle of the wounded heart is cardiography. Pericardiosynthesis is not surgery available. Diagnosis to patient using the correct elements too. Choose the incision, open the pericardium, and fingers and foley catheters are the good friends, and localize the injury. Thank you very much.